So this was an interesting panel because we wanted to acknowledge a lot of the themes that you've heard already today. You know, obviously, as I mentioned, we'll be being professional logistics people in the afternoon. We'll talk a lot about how the, the, the profit margins, you know, you could argue that cross-border has lived off of some of those international shipping margins over the years. I'll leave it to the, to the folks out in the, the um, foyer to tell you more about that. We heard a lot at Shop Talk about how people are getting squeezed on those margins at the bottom. And at the same time, we talked a little bit about uh, how the media costs are, are zooming up and how people are having to look more at social. It's all about how to kind of get more out of that middle part of the funnel. So we're calling this building trust via innovation. It, it is challenging times. You're getting kind of squeezed at both ends. And I'm going to let Bennett uh, introduce himself in a second, tell us a little bit about some of the stuff that they're seeing. He's fresh off of their own event uh, that Signify had back in New York, Flow. But first, Raj, I want to welcome you, another first timer. So thank you so much for coming. We had a great time at dinner last night as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background, Amazon, Paul's Choice. Now you're building the Nutribolt team. Tell us more. Yeah, sure. Well, hi, everyone. Um, it's really an honor to be here. I'm super excited. Um, I, uh, well, I've been now at Nutribolt almost um, 21 months, almost two years. Wow. Uh, came in as a chief digital officer to lead a digital transformation. Um, we had a digital business that was quite sizable, but we really needed to ignite it to accelerate its growth and then got promoted to CMO about a year later. And it's been almost now two years. Started my career as a classically trained brand manager in CPG companies, um, uh, Maple Leaf Foods, which is like the PNG of Canada, a $5 billion company started as a rotational managerial program back in the day when those programs were really the right way to start a business career. And then um, went on to do global marketing for a juice drink company that created the orange drink category in Latin and South America called Tampico was there for four years, led global marketing and innovation in 57 countries, kind of had the taste for global marketing campaigns for the first time, building integrated marketing plans and helping bottlers and licensees, and we had a lot of Coke and Pepsi bottlers, mm -hmm. to pay attention and give us more of their budget and media budget to support the brand. So influence slash also innovation and driving you know great creative assets to really uh, advance the marketing agenda and the brand building agenda. Agenda, then went to Coors Light at Miller Coors. This was all in Chicago, where a beer brand that was the number two beer brand in, uh, in the premium lights category, very uh, mainstream, but really kind of became part of the brand team and started leading social and digital back in 2011, when it was just starting. Right. And saw the power of social that was almost like an equalizer for brands. How do you build brand awareness very cost effectively and drive breakthrough moments, no matter how big or small you are. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, then Kellogg's and Starbucks afterwards, um, leading uh, brand market innovation for millennial consumers and multicultural consumers, and also working again in Latin America with the PepsiCo Starbucks joint venture, uh, launched Frappuccino, Double Shot, and then went to Paul and then went to Amazon, got recruited by Amazon, started my e-commerce career and kind of had a midlife crisis as a, mid, as a marketer, as a brand marketer. I was like, I want to leave CPG, I want to leave food and beverage and work in e-commerce, you know? And it was an amazing school, amazing school for scale, automation, and I was the head of category for luxury skincare, which was a passion category for me that I didn't, have to, that I didn't work in yet. And, um, and that really gave me a, a very good look on how do you build multiple brands, not only in terms of revenue, but also awareness, and how do you use the Amazon platform to really help with those efforts and e-commerce in general. Went to Paula's Choice uh, Skincare, which is a, one of the few beauty brands in Seattle, and they were looking for brand builders that knew how to understand how do you build brands, bringing them to the mainstream, and making the brand cool again. A 24-year-old brand that the CMO and CEO told me at the time, this is the target consumer for this uh, brand is a 45-year-old woman from mid-America, mm -hmm. and uh, we want you to make it cool and become an Instagram darling. And that's what I did in a year and a half. The brand became number nine most talked about brand in social and digital. Took the brand from 50,000 on Instagram to 250. 
got it built and distributed in Sephora before uh, Sephora did not want to look at it because it didn't have an Instagram following. Right, interesting. And influencers, and I built a playbook that I brought you know, to Snap Kitchen afterwards, brought me to um, uh, Austin as a VP of marketing and e-commerce, and then came to Nutribolt and used that playbook to bring C4 Energy to the mainstream, the fastest energy drink in the, in the country. Yeah, well, I want to come back to the whole kind of social building at, at you know, Nutribolt versus Politics. Sure. Where are you guys selling Nutribolt International? I know we talked a lot about Japan on, on a couple of prep Absolutely. Prep calls. So we've got three brands. C4 Energy is the beverage ener performance energy drink. It's a better for you, cleaner energy drink. We sell it in um, mainly the UK, Germany, as well as the US. Mm -hmm. But the sports nutrition, the supplements, and the health and wellness portfolio, which the brands are Cellacore, C4 Powder, and Extend, um, is sold in the UK, Germany, primarily in Japan for e-commerce on mm -hmm. Amazon Japan and Rakuten, as well as Korea. And, um, and Spain, Italy, and some other markets. But we're in 154, 150 countries through e-tail uh, e as well as third marketplaces. Got it. And I remember when we were talking originally, you, you, you made the case when you were talking about Paula's Choice versus Nutribelt, the, the ingredients are part of this making, you know, creating trust. So Bennett, I'm gonna turn it over to you, let you introduce yourself a little bit. You know, a lot of the uh, kind of, uh, momentum behind the, this session was from Bennett's idea, so I want to give him a shout out there. But walk us through a little bit about kind of what you guys are seeing across the, the customer base and this whole idea of innovating in the middle of the funnel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Bennett. I go by my surname. I have for decades, so nice to, if you want to chat with me, if you still call me Jay or John, I'll be like, who? Um, so I'm Bennett. Um, always a pleasure to be a Gelf. Um, I'm SVP of Operations and Corp Dev um, at Signified. Unlike Raja, who's a consummate professional who knows what she's doing, I'm, a, I'm an unapologetic, unapologetic generalist. I went to film school. This is not the first time I've been here. I went to USC film school. I was taught special education, eighth grade math in the Bronx. I started my own ed tech company, sold that to Kaplan. Then I uh, represented Wilson Cincini uh, Gooder Trinzati for Google, Salesforce, Tesla, which is how I met Signified many, many years ago. They were a baby client of mine. And today I head up, most relevantly, our customer teams and our um, business intelligence teams. So uh, eBay, Walmart, and mom and pops on Shopify are our clients. And I'll talk a little bit about where some of that data comes Go from. Go for it. So um, if we, we just had our flow event um, in New York, we had about 350 people attend. It was so exciting to have people in person, so exciting to have people in person here. Uh, welcome. Forrester public, used that as an excuse to publish like one of the things of how do we understand our customers? How do we build trust with our customers? There's a lot on this page. This is a Forrester slide. I'm shamelessly stealing it. I really just wanted to focus, however, on the number two on this list, which is everybody's trying to make money and try to be profitable in e-commerce. Okay, 10% of people are there to buy. 90% of people are there to not buy. How do you know which is which? Can you figure that out? Can you help people understand why I should trust you so that I'm looking today, I'm browsing today. When I come back, I know that I'm gonna to come to your site, to your D2C site, or I'm gonna buy through Rakuten, and I'm gonna choose your product because I basically had a brand experience while using your web page. There are two ways to read this. Do you build a site for the 90% or do you build a site for the 10%? It's a really hard question mm -hmm. because you make money on the 10, but your future growth is in the 90. So you have to really understand what are you doing with that experience. And so Signified really focuses on the 10 and you focus on the 90. So again, you, you went on this round too. But if we take a look at kind of over here on the left, you have, there, that's an Instagram and a Google. I am purposely kind of living that out. That's not my area of expertise. Uh, the return on the cart is what Samsung talked about at Flow. They doubled from $2 billion to $4 billion in U.S. sales and then also cross-border sales, but they only increased their OPEX by 15%. Absolutely stunning transformation in terms of profitability. Everyone's like, that 10%, I'm fighting tooth and nail to get every single sale, make sure that it works out right. I want the cart to be instant. I want the cart to have every payment option. I want people to know exactly what they're gonna pay, when they're gonna get it, I wanna trade in. I want everything. The best experience buying a Samsung phone versus Best Buy or any of the other distribution channels that they could have. They crushed it. 
if you think about how you build trust, <clears throat> I went to Harvard Law School, so apologies. I'm, I'm borrowing from HBR here. So <laughs> relationship is one of the first key points in building trust. Do I trust you? Do we have a relationship? Correct. That's your realm. Brand. I need someone to understand who I am. I'm shopping. I'm browsing. Who are you? What's this brand? Let me learn a little bit about you. OK, what do you have? Let me build a relationship. Then you have to have expertise. OK, payments expertise. Can I get it into the bank? Can I get a, an authorization? Can I, do I know this consumer? Can I say yes instantly and then do that? And then after that, it's all about consistency. Do you actually deliver on the promise? Hey, and then can you go back into actually get repeat purchases? So what we've seen people who are profitable now, it's folks like you who are like, hey, I'm not going to pay Instagram or Google or all these crazy, like, top squeezing, I'm going to figure out a way to have really innovative, cost-effective marketing techniques. And then it's people on the back end who have figured out how to get repeat purchases from that perspective. And everybody who comes of the 10% who wants to buy, they buy. I think I talk to hundreds of merchants a year. Very few people can answer that question mark percentage until they work with us. It's very, very hard to measure customer lifetime value and mm -hmm. can you get people back. Yeah. So putting a little bit of this together, we work with thousands of merchants worldwide. You'll note um, we actually have difficulties working with China because of privacy laws. So I think that will become a very interesting um, question going forward about China, mainland China, um, as a market for anybody who's not using a local distributor or a local partner there. But we have one last slide to talk about kind of our scale. So if those are the relationships. We can help with that expertise. Amazon has about 300 million folks who either have a prime or have used a guest checkout in 2021. Signified has a larger volume in terms of a, an email address plus a device plus a payment instrument, deduped. And so if you're going into a market and you want to say yes to somebody and you want to, like, hey, do you want to have Grupo Electra in Mexico? Yes. Do you want to have eBanks and VTEX in Brazil? Yes. Do you want to have Rakuten's network in Japan? Yes. So you use a distributor in those local places, and then your D2C channels, you probably need to use somebody like us. So there you go. Got Fantastic. it. And, and I see a lot of similarities. I mean, just uh, when I talk about brand, that's one piece of the work that I do. But when we started the digital transformation, especially for direct-to-consumer, we were a, very, a low seven-figure business. When we revamped the brand, built the trust, built education, content at a top funnel that's organic, with it, you know, because we try to do as much stuff organic and earned instead of paid on, on, on the Instagrams and the Facebooks of the world, we really saw a direct correlation on the conversions on the site. And our Higher conversion quality. rate yes. absolutely yes. went from 1.5% to 3.2% in a matter of a year and three months. And that resulted in increase in the, our direct-to-consumer revenue. I can't say numbers, but from low seven figures to um, now running on high eight, I mean, uh, on the mid eight figures, which is really exciting over a course of two years. And, uh, and that's what it starts. The fundamentals are key, right? You can affect conversion rate. You can affect UX, UI, your customer journey experience, and the way they get to understand the value proposition of your brand and your product through the different digital channels. Each one is serving a purpose, and they need to be working concomitantly and in sync, depending on the life cycle journey of that customer and the brand itself. Because a brand evolution goes through different stages. So well said. The fundamentals of like, what can I affect, right? Can I, can I affect my cost per click? Yes. Don't pay for the click. Earn the click. Right. Can I affect the conversion? Yes. Say yes to the right people. Can I build brand loyalty and then get people back in? That's yes. exactly it. That's exactly it. And the other piece is there's so many things just to finish on the on-site experience. Like you were talking about our product, just what Nutribolt, you know, we're going to be, we're on track to become the health and wellness, the PNG of health and wellness, the human performance company. And uh, our product truly maximize people's human potential, right? And for us to be able to fulfill on that promise, we got to have the education and grounding consumers in our product's value proposition. If we fail to do that, 
that is where conversion rate is not moving in the right place. So it's so great DTC e-commerce platforms to be able to serve that purpose of education, making it really compelling mm -hmm. and entertaining and educating, bringing something of value to the consumer. It's not, it's not site, it's not just about transaction. A site is about really accompanying the customer throughout their health and wellness journey in our case. And that's where people come back. Like we saw a lot of improvements in our CLTV when we started doing that in the early in nascency of our digital transformation on DTC. Um, and having products like Nutribolt and Polish Choice that are really rooted in science, people are hungry for that education. There is macro trends that we see with consumers. They want to know more about the ingredients they're putting in their body or their skin. They want to be able to be educated and they want to take out all the frills and the fairy dusting and the buzzwords. They want simple, trustworthy, results-driven product, but with a brand that gets them to bring that top of funnel experience because they're compelled from an emotional connection perspective. And that's something else that I can talk about later. <laughs> well, I wanted to pick up on, well, of course, results, another RE that I, I missed in my, my, my cloud earlier today. Um, you talked about building the relationship. Obviously, we've talked a lot this morning about how the customer journey has changed, you know, country to country. Although at the same time, it's like when everybody around the world's working from home, there was this commonality as well. Uh, what are you seeing as far as when you're building trust, and you know, whether it's through some of your social initiatives or even you know more on-site experience? What are the differences you're seeing from market to market? It's a great question. I mean, I think COVID has been the equalizer, but also how markets have recovered from COVID is very different. Um, when we see the US post COVID and we were able to take advantage, it was a, a, an opportunity for us to drive digital transformation and acceleration in terms of revenue, but also experiences in the US in a way that was very effective and short I mean, and, and in a short amount of time, but that was not what we've seen in Japan or what we've seen in the UK or Canada, where it was a longer time of lockdown, longer to recover. But when the vaccination rates have gone up and people went back to normal, then you see some opening. Mm -hmm. That's very much indicative of how that post recovery is really different. And it's putting those markets in a different evolution of the purchasing journey and getting back reacquainted with brands. Right. right. What are you guys seeing? I mean, I know yeah. China is, I mean, you see the crazy stuff going on in Shanghai where people are being yeah. dragged out of their houses, you know, so setting aside all that, because I know you guys haven't been as focused on China, uh, what are you guys seeing? <laughs> Russian crime rings. Um, <laughs> but on, honestly, yes, we do. So are they on our side now? <laughs> no, or, yeah, no who, they are. Who are the Russian crime <laughs> people fighting for now, anyway? <laughs> no, uh, if you want to, we have a crime and cocktail series if you want to hear fun stories of, of us catching wow. fraud rings. Um, but uh, from a actual consumer basis. What we're seeing, uh, your experience is very similar. Um, we saw COVID waves cut across, sh um, shutdowns, and then e-commerce just spiked. And I think the emerging markets um, were already, anyone who is projected to grow, grew even faster. Mm -hmm. Anyone who is projected to be stagnant, grew. And what we've found is that now there's a little bit of a pullback, right, post, right. and I think people are probably feeling it. And so that's why we've shifted our talk track to be more about how do you have profitable growth. Correct. We're frankly seeing people um, who have not been able to get repeat customers and not been able to really focus on the conversion, uh, the healthy conversion, they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we, we actually internally projected a lot of bankruptcies um, post COVID, like in the middle of COVID. They're starting to happen now. And okay. so it seems like a lot of the smaller players are kind of shifting over here and consumers have kind of settled in their choices. There was a huge influx of consumers who said, I'm gonna try this channel for the first time. They built brand loyalty. The brands that won have won. The ones that have not won, ooh, Correct. it's, it's kind of rough. And so that's what we're seeing. And I, I actually think that um, Brexit has complicated that. Um, the the, um, the Chinese um, manufacturing and Vietnamese manufacturing has really complicated that in terms of the costs. So um, consumers in general, especially in the, well, I mean, this is Gelf, but U.S. Mm -hmm. consumers are sitting on a lot of cash. Yeah. yeah. They have so much money to spend. Um, Latin American um, has huge amounts of folks that are, 
entered into the market, EMEA is EMEA. It's kind of been kind of steady. I think that yeah. the, right. the biggest growth areas for us are emerging markets, and I think some of the folks mentioned Southeast Asia. Lots of folks are doing quite well there. Yeah, I mean, that's what we saw in Rob's data. I mean, are you guys, how are you looking, you know, we're in different parts of to, Southeast Asia? I mean, we're looking and we're researching very aggressively some of those markets to whether it's um, through cross-border or through e-tail or through marketplaces. It was just such a big opportunity. I mean, mm -hmm. Singapore, I mean, Korea even accelerating that even more. Um, I think um, that is a huge, and India is a way we have a lot of equity uh, for the brand. It's a great fitness audience. It's a huge market. The regulation is always something that makes us pause, right? Mm -hmm. Because the complex, more complex the market is, COVID didn't make that any less complicated. <laughs> right, so true. <laughs> Would you say so, so? So true. Which is why China, a lot of people are coming out and they're not going back to China for a little bit uh, until these things kind of settle down. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point, but I think EMEA it is what it is, and, but Asia and Southeast Asia are very promising. Yeah, and you know, recession was a word I purposely didn't put on the uh, on the cloud picture earlier. No, don't but, put it out there. But that, it did come up, and I, I yeah. think you're right. There is this kind of haves and haves nots, and uh, the the other re word I didn't put on was something actually James and I were talking about at Etel West, the repricing issues. Yes. So uh, especially when you know some of the stuff that you guys are working with with Amazon, and they're just figuring out the price. So there's this constant repricing, which. Not sure how that impacts the, the middle of the funnel, but uh, it, it, it definitely came up as like one of his big challenges. Oh, absolutely. I mean, with the recession, inflation, obviously there's going to be price increases. Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies in our space and in others are taking it for the second, the third time in the year, right? Or right. they're going to plan to. Um, it, it's so critical uh, that omni-channel price uh, you know, a holistic uh, system is working really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there needs to be omnichannel price in harmony because if that is not the case, it becomes chaos very quickly. Right. And, and it's what's hard is that we just, it's so uncertain. So, I mean, but e-commerce, that's the beauty of it is that digital and e-commerce helps us to pivot so quickly mm -hmm. and needing to really, that's why diversification of digital channels is so key because you may be having difficulties around repricing, which is part of what Amazon and now even more Walmart.com, et cetera, are, are, are making vendors and brands experience. But there is opportunities in international and DTC where we're looking right now to even, uh, you know, that horizon. We started in the US first to make our fundamentals and make our DTC engine really strong. But there is so much opportunity. Uh, I think EMEA, for example, yeah, COVID changed the habits forever, where you all think Europe goes a little bit later adopting e-commerce habits. But I think with COVID, Portugal, Spain, UK, really using Amazon and other DTC channels part of their uh, shopping habits and mm -hmm. even meal delivery, you know, and that's here to stay. So that's something that's completely untapped. And I think that's really exciting. Just the, the pricing, repricing, inflation, where does that fit with the, you know, kind of the fraud triggers and things yeah. like that? Yeah, I mean, um, what, what the, the, the trend is GMV is up, average order value is up, transactions are down. And so it becomes, if the transaction count goes down, mm -hmm. that 10% means that there are fewer good customers. <laughs> right. So everyone's fighting over fewer good customers yeah. who are transacting. What we're seeing is people are spending more time browsing now mm -hmm. and they're developing brand affinities. So brands like yours, I think a suite of like holistic health brands, like, hey, I have, I have my skincare regimen, right? Okay, well, I've consolidated and now I have like two brands. They're both French, so I think you'll be proud <laughs> of me. Um, and, I, but that's all I use. And so now I have repeat purchase from them. And all of the other brands who could have gotten my dollars don't. And we're seeing consumers do that. They're saying, you know what? How many brand relationships do I want to have? I'm going to spend more. I'm going to get a bigger AOV so that I can get free shipping. So I'm going to consolidate my purchases. So AOV is up. GMV is up but there are fewer opportunities to capture new customers. And we're seeing a drop in conversion rate as a result, right? Yes. AOV is higher, drop in conversion, because now customers and consumers are shopping more mm -hmm. and you've got traffic, but they're bouncing or they're going to the 
where there is a repricer in effect to the platform that's going to give them the lowest price and mm -hmm. there their bulk or their cross buying. So that is, and we see that definitely with this phenomenon, yeah, for sure. And it's a reality that is concerning. Yeah, I had one, we had a great conversation about some of the work you did at Paula's Choice as far as the social and obviously talking about building relationships. You guys are, you have a very interesting stable of kind of celebrities and things like that. But before we wrap up with that, are there any questions, uh, any, anything from the audience that we can touch on here before we, we start to wrap up? Okay, cool. Uh, tell us a little bit about, so again, this, this establishing trust, the, the importance um, of social, but not necessarily, as uh, I think Kelly put it earlier, the moving more towards the, you know, the nano influencers and the Correct. micro influencers and away from the, okay, you know, I, I don't know if you guys heard that, that uh, line from Coachella where it's like, influencers only on this bus. If you don't have an influencer badge, please go away. <laughs> so it's kind of like, okay, maybe, uh, maybe it's time for a, kind of a reality check. Well, we've had a lot of evolution of influencer marketing over the past eight, nine years, I would say. When we were at Polish Choice and where, when I led that creative and brand transformation for the brand, it was beyond social. It mm -hmm. was brand fundamentals. It was the brand was a little bit stuck in the 1990s. That's right. how the site looked. And we're like, for a Gen Z or a young millennial that comes on a site, are they compelled to stay here when you look at the drunk elephants, the Sephoras that are really making this part of the site experience, the, the, the consumer experience. So we had to really establish trust to go back to the basic. Look at that, the brand had a cult following, but it was not an engaged or ignited cult following. Got it. It lived in the fringes. So it was really, we built the brand by starting to just send products through the consumers and the influencers that loved the brand from before spoke about it using social listening tools, lose, using really a lot of research and consumer research that, that my team did and myself, because we were a small team, we were mm -hmm. a team of three. And I was competing against brands that had seven, nine people in their influencer team alone. Wow. This was the whole brand team, social brand, digital content, that was my team. At the end of my year and a half there, I had a team of 14, but that's uh, you know because of all the great success. But we went and did a tiered approach. I mean. Macros and nan nanos are important because they have more of that engaged audience, mm -hmm. smaller audience, but a higher engagement rate. People are more engaged with their content, so they're able to really endorse your brand and drive purchase, right? So we went and looked for those consumers that just love the brand, anyone. Anyone who's been in love with the brand for the past 20 years, lately, but then also went to the macros and the tier ones where these people are the celebrities. And we've been very lucky to be able to tap into that using social and digital metrics and social listening tools to find out this is the celebrity hairdresser of JLo that loves the brand and uses it to prep faces before he puts on a red carpet makeup look. I could have used that today. <laughs> <laughs> so Send Product really ignited and built the brand for you know this influencer uh, squad from 30 micros that had maybe a combined reach of you know a um, few millions to 700 influencers that had the combined reach of over 200 million uh, consumers. Kind of reminds me of the signified version yes, of Amazon's here. Yes, exactly. We still get to see here. Yeah. And it, it, it's really, and also it's opened up the brand from the mid-America, which is great, to younger, more diverse, people saw them, especially for a skincare brand, and that was really important for me, a person of color, a person like me who's an immigrant, who I didn't see myself growing up in the, a lot of French brands, a lot of luxury brands, and Paula's Choice was speaking finally to all cohorts. LGBTQ, we had one of the first, uh, you know, um, uh, gay LGBTQ influencers, male and female, that were really talking about the brand, makeup artists, and really, and also leveraging the brand. The brand had also a lot of love in Asia. Mm -hmm. Paula was like, the, she called herself the Bruno Mars of Korea. So when she did, <laughs> she did store openings, it was really a big celebrity moment, but you know, that was 20 years ago when she was, she could come on Oprah and really build her top of funnel. Now influencers needed to do that for that. So that's what I was able to do and started tapping into Asian American influencers that loved the brand, knew and had a lot of credibility already and had huge following. 
So it's really about the ones that have a lot of followers that are your speaker phone, and also all the way at the bottom of the funnel with the smaller followings that build your trust and drive conversions. Uh, That's so the way to one go. last question, Bennett, back to kind of the middle of the funnel and also reflecting on the, the panel we had before where you know, different segments, whether it's young, whether it's middle-aged, middle America, uh, is there any kind of takeaways for the, the innovation in the middle of the funnel that differs by age group? I mean, do you just assume that the younger people are going to be on mobile and therefore you kind of, you know, the device takes care of itself or what do you guys see in there? It might as well be completely different technology stacks. So yes, you, you, the, the funnel from a technology perspective, the funnel from uh, how do you find these people is completely different. So uh, social uh, engagement influencer, they're going to buy something because they heard somebody else buy it in mm -hmm. that way versus a search, right, or an ad. Um, all the way down to the payment methods, all the way down to like, do they try before they buy? Do they want to pay now, um, you know, kind of like, do they order in bulk? Do they mm -hmm. not order in bulk? How much brand loyalty do they have? Um, yes, they're, they're different in every possible way. And I think that what's most interesting is there's obviously new young consumers mm -hmm. coming in by definition right. every year, right? <laughs> you know, someone who's 19 for the first time, um, card not present or online, we also have had a huge influx of older, more affluent folks who frankly didn't like shopping online. Right. And those people are now kicking around in the ecosystem. Correct. And I think that those folks have a uh, huge potential, but they have very different needs. So in every possible way, they're different. Got Absolutely. It. All right, well, we ran a little bit over this morning. Uh, we're gonna try to uh, get back on schedule after our nice long networking lunch. So appreciate everybody uh, sticking your heads in here. I know there's folks over in theater too. We're all gonna get back out together for lunch. So maybe a quick round of applause. Thank you so much, Thank Raja you. and Bennett. Great job. Thank you.